This conference will now be recorded. Well, welcome, my brothers and sisters, to our noonday Bible study on 1 Timothy. Uh, today, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 uh, through 16. I do want to remind us uh, that coming up soon, this Sunday, we will have the retirement celebration for Brother Johnny Jordan. And uh, we want to bring uh, our gifts. Uh, let that brother know how we appreciate him. He is building a studio in his home, uh, a musical studio, and uh, we want to be part of that. I also want to let you know that um, starting on April the uh, 17th, April 17th, 24th, uh, May 1st, and May 8th, we will have some personal evangelism workshops. The workshop builds, and so you want to lock in all of those dates for one hour at um, uh, the time starts at 11 a.m., 11 to 12, and uh, Dr. Leroy Armstrong will be our convener and our, our uh, facilitator, and these will be four one-hour workshops on personal evangelism. So please put that on your calendar. We'd like every member of Second Baptist to attend so that we learn how to share our faith with others, okay? All right, our schedule then uh, has us today working on 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 16. Chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 25 is available for those that wish to download it. And then don't forget that you need Dr. Constable's notes uh, to to use for this study. Uh, and you can get those by just Googling Dr. Constable's notes. Go to PlanoBibleChapel.org and you can either download them or you can use them online. And we're using the notes on 1 Timothy. So I wanna encourage everybody, make sure you have the notes. Part of our study will require you to read the notes to get the information you need to answer our Bible study questions. You can download the notes, and I believe that there is a way for you to, to contribute uh, to the ministry of Dr. Thomas Constable um, um, as you use the notes for free. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to pay for them, and so I just think that we ought to, we ought to give a little back, amen. All right, let's go to our uh, our scripture then, which is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 10. And I'm going to start reading at chapter 4, verse 1. And you will notice that I intentionally went back and grabbed the uh, um, prior context so that we would be making sense of what the text says. So chapter four, verse one. Now the spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will depart. Uh, hold on just a second. I need to make an adjustment. Here. Some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished by the words of the faith and the good teachings that you have followed, but have nothing to do with pointless and silliness. Rather, train yourself in godliness, for the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. For this reason, we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone despise your youth. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, give your attention to public reading, exhortation, and teaching. Don't neglect the gift that is in you, 
It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Practice these things, be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, that's our text. So we will start uh, our uh, objective today is to understand and emulate the standards and responsibilities for Christian leadership. Uh, for of, of example, of, ooh, let me rewind. <laughs> to understand and emulate the standards and responsibilities of exemplary church leadership. Uh, Paul tells Timothy, uh, he, he reminds him to command, he, to, to command and teach certain things. And those certain things are contained in chapter three, verse 16. We have to go back to the previous context and the reason that Paul wrote what he was writing uh, is he wrote these positive directions to enable Timothy to overcome the influence uh, of the apostates who had adopted asceticism. And uh, he also wrote to remind him of the imperative uh, importance of his personal life and ministry so that he wouldn't fall into the same errors. He's reminding him basically to that the, and, and this is a, a phrase that Pastor Avril Royal used to say to us, that the basics bl bring the blessings. The basics bring the blessings. He tells him to watch his life, his teaching, and uh, not to neglect what God has deposited in him that is to be shared with others, and that would help keep the church on track. Uh, he, he, the, the things that he was referring to, remember we talked about the mystery of the faith, which described the incarnation, the resurrection, uh, the post-resurrection sightings of Jesus. I remember that he was on earth for 40 days according to Acts 1, after the resurrection in which he taught the disciples about the kingdom. Uh, the proclamation by the disciples, the regeneration of those who hear and believe the witness and Christ's ascension. And so these are the, the core doctrines that Paul wanted the church to uh, uh, hold on to because there were some who were abandoning the truth. Um, and in the beginning of chapter four, he reminds them that there were some who will fall away uh, that they will become, uh, uh, they will give their attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons because their minds uh, have been seared or cauterized and that these folk would come from inside the church, not outside. Outside teachers would try to draw the church away. And so one of the things that we must constantly be aware of is that there are those that are trying to get the church to abandon the truth and that carnal Christians who follow the impulses of their sinful nature, uh, those are the people that God will try to use to lead Christians astray. Uh, and you can remember there were some examples in the scripture, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, you could use the example of Simon the sorcerer. Uh, they want power, position, and pleasure. And so they try to teach others uh, to, to abandon the teachings of the church. Uh, as a matter of fact, Paul describes them as having a seared conscience, meaning that they refuse to respond to the truth uh, because they have allowed themselves to be influenced by lies. And we pointed out the quote by Pastor Jack Wellman that by tuning out the spirit of God, we are making it harder each time for the spirit of God to, to, to speak to us. Some people will block out what God is saying because they don't want to do what God commands. And it's really just that simple. 
Uh, they don't want to hear what the Lord says, because if I believe that what the Lord says is authoritative, then I have to do what he says. And so they have deceived themselves. Um, um, they have anesthetized their consciences by the habit of deceiving themselves. And we pointed out that they deceive three groups. One, they deceive themselves. They deceive those who would come to Christ and they deceive those who are following Christ. And the way that they were deceiving people in this writing that Paul is writing to Timothy is that they were insisting on a false righteousness called asceticism, that abstinence from physical things was necessary for spiritual purity. For instance, they encourage people not to marry, not to eat certain kinds of food. And uh, this teaching was harmful uh, because God intends us to use what he has created according to his word for our good. Okay, there are questions coming up now. Feel free to ask at any time. Uh, could you please repeat the uh, lesson objective? Yes, I can. Thank you. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. The lesson objective is for us to, let me get it on the screen, for us to understand and emulate the standards and responsibilities of exemplary church leadership. For us to understand and emulate the standards uh, of exemplary church leadership, the standards and responsibilities. And so one of those responsibilities is for Timothy to not allow the people of God nor himself to fall prey to this idea of asceticism, but rather to enjoy what God has created as long as we do it God's way. Well, what, is God, what is God's way? It is to, uh, um, that everything is good as long as we thank God for his gifts, um, that we uh, use them according to his word, and we acknowledge them through prayer. Um, remember that sin comes when we abandon what God has said. And what they were doing is heaping on a layer above what God has said. I was talking to a pastoral colleague this past week and his church was adopting a standard code of conduct for its members. And in that code of conduct, they had added a couple of things that were unscriptural. And I told him, I said, man, you can't add that and hold people to it if the Bible doesn't, because you are creating a, a, a legalistic law that the scripture does not create. And we have to be careful about equating external legalism with genuine Christianity. God intends for us to enjoy what he has created as long as we are doing it according to his word. And that includes marriage and food and life and relationship with others. Rev, you had a question? Yes, sir. Uh, I guess two things. One, in our covenant, and I think we touched on this last week, it uh, we are to abstain from the sale of use of alcohol and beverage, I mean, alcoholic uh, drink as a beverage. That goes beyond the scripture and that's what you really mean by um that that legalism that extra layer yeah. okay <clears throat> yeah now and, the and reason I, go ahead i'm sorry no 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 go ahead this i'm gonna do I just, i've got another thought too but go ahead no shoot go ahead okay. and get them out well, the other one is um you're not saying for the individual to take whatever necessary steps they can take to um like if I'm an alcoholic, I, I can personally stop all alcohol. Right. That'd be my personal goal, and that's that's okay, right? Right, right, okay. absolutely. Sure. So if 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 I have an issue with something that causes me to sin, and this goes back to the argument in First Corinthians about the law of love, 
I shouldn't do anything that's going to either cause somebody else to stumble or something that's going to lead me to stumble. If I know that I don't have self-control in an area, I need to leave that alone because it can wind, I can wind up in sin. If I have an issue with alcohol and I drink too much, I'm going to wind up drunk. If I have an issue with food and I eat too much, I'm going to wind up uh, uh, in gluttony. Uh, if I have an issue with certain foods that may cause my health to be bad, I should avoid those. Um, um, and so it's it goes back to the law of love. Go ahead, sister. Somebody else had a question? Now, what we agree to in the church covenant, we have agreed to because of that law of love. Um, but one of the things we have to be careful with is making agreements that are unbiblical and then lying about it in public. And so that's one of the things that I encourage us not to do. Uh, you'll never see me do certain things in public because I don't want to cause somebody else to stumble. But that doesn't, let, let me give you an example. Back in the day, Christians wouldn't go to the movies. I don't know if some of you all are old enough to remember that. Uh, but church folk, <laughs> let me call them that. Church folk didn't go to the movies because the movies were seen as something that was worldly and evil. Uh, um, but they would watch them at home. <laughs> and so uh, we had to be careful about falling prey to this idea of external righteousness without an internal heart change, okay? And so that's really kind of the rewind uh, of, of what Paul was saying about these things that Timothy was to teach the people about. And if you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, uh, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Paul's point was Timothy had a certain responsibility to the church, to those who followed him, to uh, teach them and nourish them with the words of the faith. Um, he was to point out God's truth, excuse me, about these good gifts. Um, um, and he should not get caught up in these fables. So Timothy had a responsibility to the people he served, but he also had a responsibility for himself. And that responsibility was that he should train himself in godliness. Uh, he needed to develop a rigorous self-discipline. This is something that is required in ministry and of ministry leaders pastors and preachers, anybody that serves in a capacity in ministry, we have to train ourselves in godliness. And let me give you something to write down. Promotion does not develop character. It exposes it. Promotion does not develop character. It exposes it. The higher one ascends, the more easily their character may be revealed. The higher one ascends, the more easily their character may be revealed. Promotion does not develop character, it reveals it. The same problems that Bill Clinton had in Arkansas showed up in the White House. Same issues he had with women in Arkansas showed up in the White House. Whatever our issues are, as the Lord lifts us to different levels of leadership, we must discipline ourselves or our lack of discipline will show up as flawed character, okay? And so we must remember that discipline creates lifestyle. Timothy was to nourish himself on the truth of God's word. Um, um, he himself 
would have to be plugged into what God was saying. Otherwise, he would be so busy feeding the people, he'd forget to, fe to feed himself. And I can tell you that any minister who is engaged in ministry simply for the purpose of assignment is going to wind up morally bankrupt and in trouble if we don't practice the lifestyle that we preach about is going to create problems for us and the church. And so uh, I want to encourage all of us uh, to be praying for our Christian leaders, but also to make sure that those of us who serve in various capacities of leadership are nourishing ourselves. And that's part of the reason why we're here today. But before I come communicate with you all, I need to be in communication with the Lord. Before I'm teaching you, I need to be studying. Before I'm leading you in prayer, I need to be praying for myself. Before I'm preaching to the congregation, I need to be reading and hearing what God has to say to me in private because it is discipline that creates lifestyle, okay? Any questions That's about that? That's why I was yes. using the higher one ascends, uh, um, you said pr promotion does not develop character, it expresses it. The higher one- It ascends. reveals it. Yeah. Okay. It, promotion does not, promotion does not develop character, it reveals it. Okay. And yeah. the higher one ascends, mm -hmm. the more likely it is for that character to be revealed. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? All right. So whatever, and I, 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 I pray to God that someday I'll have the opportunity to go back to my alma mater, the seminary, and share with them. Because whatever issues we have when we're getting started in leadership, those issues are not going to go away. We have to overcome them and discipline ourselves against them because they will come back, okay? And so we're supposed, we, we are to command and teach uh, these things. Well, what was it that, that, that Paul wanted Timothy to, to command and teach in verse eight? He wanted him to command and teach that bodily training only has limited benefits, but godliness is beneficial uh, in every way. And so Timothy was to, discipline himself spiritually, not just physically. You see a lot of people that spend a lot of time conditioning their body. How many of us condition our souls, okay? Let me give us an example. We cannot wait until we are faced with certain temptations to figure out what we should do. We should have developed disciplined strategies of what we will do in advance. If I know I have a problem and I don't have a problem cussing people out, but let's say that someone has that problem, that that's, their, that's one of their areas uh, of sin, that they curse and they use profanity when somebody makes them angry, then that person needs to develop a strategy for what they will say when someone makes them angry. If a man knows that he has a problem with pornography, then he needs to develop a strategy for what he will do when he's tempted. He needs to figure out what God's word says about it, figure out what he will do. If a woman has a problem, uh, we're talking about people that being a gossip or running people down behind their back. She needs to develop a strategy of how she can speak positive words of affirmation about people and pray for people rather than burn up those phone lines. Uh, um, this is spiritual discipline. And part of being a Christian is developing spiritual discipline. And some people spend their whole life shouting, hollering, and screaming, and praising God, but they don't develop that spiritual discipline that comes. And that's part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so Paul encourages Timothy to set the example Set the example. Don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. And remember that Paul speaking to Timothy, Timothy's under 40 years old, but he is the elder over all the churches of Ephesus. And so he's reminding him, just because you are young, it does not mean that people can look down on you, but you're supposed to set the example. 
Well, where does that example come from? It comes from your conduct, your love, your faith, and your purity. It also comes from your, from your lifestyle and what you are supposed to do. So one of the issues that we need to recognize is that our relational attitude affects leadership. Um, church leaders, pastors and other church leaders ought to be able to relate to people like they are family. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And some of us, if we're honest, are not comfortable with this because we think that people are trying to exploit us or use us or want something in return. And I don't want to get into a relationship with this person because I'm worried about what they might do to me. That's a toxic environment. We need to get some professional counseling and perhaps even some therapy connect with a therapist to get over some of our issues because believers ought to be able to relate to one another as brothers and sisters, as families. And as a pastoral leader or a church leader, we ought to deal with people in churches positively the way we would with our own flesh and blood. There are times when I as pastor have had to apologize the staff, because I may have said something the wrong way or hurt somebody's feelings or I was too abrupt or too brusque. That's what family does. We don't try to cover up what we did. We deal with it. OK, and so this is part of the way that if we adopt this viewpoint, we can treat one another like brothers and sisters. Now, let me say something. The old school taught pastors not to get too close to the people you serve. Because if you allow people to get too close to you, it takes away what the old preachers call your slapping hanging. That means that people will not respond to your authority because you're too nice. But the reality is we ought to encourage leaders who love people enough to work with them rather than being dictators and bosses. Now, I'll be honest with you. Some people just want that. They want a leader who will just be a boss and a dictator, but that's because they have a poor mindset of relationship. Others want a leader who's a babysitter. If pastor don't call me, I got my jaws tight because he ain't called me. <laughs> Others want some other more carnally minded relationship models. But but the exemplary leadership that Timothy was supposed to have meant that he would uh, his godly lifestyle um, and his godly teaching would be the example that people ought to follow. Some folks don't respect that. If you have money and power and you can be a boss, then 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 they want you to be their leader. But it is the godly lifestyle and godly accurate teaching that matters more. Personal purity um, matters more than some of the other things we value in our society. And it is the first duty of a minister to display in his own life that which he wishes people to be. I treat people, and I'm going to be honest with you, I treat people and the Lord has worked on me on this over many years. I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. I try to do for others the what I want others to do for me. I try to express love for others the way I want people to express love for me. Because I realize that as a preacher and a pastor, my example matters. And I want to challenge every believer on here, especially if you're in leadership, in any ministry at Second Baptist Church, the example that we set both in public and in private matters. And people can see it. They're not stupid. We're not fooling anybody. They see us <laughs> even when we don't see them. So let's, let's develop that exemplary leadership. Well, Timothy had three primary pastoral responsibilities. One was to continue to make sure that the scriptures were read in public not just read, but taught. And so the first example is, uh, the first primary pastoral duty is the public reading of scripture. 
the Bible is our authority. The second was sound preaching, exhortation, the explanation and, and application of the word. It should be read, it should be preached on and taught and explained. It should be explained through exhortation. That's sound preaching. Explain it and apply it, okay? And then the third was teaching. Teach the people systematically the doctrines of the faith, what God has said, okay? Notice that these three primary pastoral duties don't have anything to do with a whole lot of stuff we think pastors are supposed to do. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Look at what they are. Read the scripture, preach and explain the scripture, teach the doctrine of the church systematically. That's what Paul gives Timothy to do. Okay. Uh, Pastor, I know sometimes the, people have, uh, uh, they don't have an understanding, like you said, of what pastors are supposed to do. I heard one woman say, well, I think I'm going to find another church because our pastor doesn't visit me. I said, visit you? <laughs> You know, visit you for what? Are you sick or whatever? If you're sick, yeah. he'll visit you. You know, I right. mean, they don't understand uh, what a pastor's supposed to do. And I think this is wonderful teaching. Praise the Lord. That's part of the deacon's ministry responsibility. Somebody asked me, Pastor, how come you're not on a prayer call every day? I'm like, that's part of the deacon's responsibility. <laughs> I've trained them how to do it. Now they are doing it. So I could be doing something else uh, that I'm supposed to be doing. And that, listen, when you are secure in your leadership, you don't mind training other people to do things and then releasing them to do it with the understanding that they have accountability and responsibility. That's how the church grows. Church grows through multiplication. Uh, and shepherds don't make sheep, sheep do. Okay. That's where... Uh... Pastor, that's what Jethro told Moses. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're going to kill yourself. <laughs> Trying to do all this. Let the Lord send you leaders that you build into and then assign them their responsibility. Hold them accountable for it. Make sure that they understand that. But pour it out on somebody else what God has poured on you. Okay? And I'm praying that the Lord will continue to send us people in every ministry of Second Baptist Church who can be taught, who can be invested in, who can learn, who can be accountable, and who can lead, and who can help share Christ with someone else. That's what our world needs desperately, okay? So Paul encourages him then not to neglect the gift. Apparently, Timothy needed some further encouragement to keep using his abilities, and he needed to be reminded. And I want to remind you today, God has given every believer spiritual gifts that can be used for the building up of the church and the reaching of the lost. That's the two purposes of spiritual gift encouragement and evangelism and god gives us those gifts uh and god had e equipped timothy uh um and they had laid hands on him they had conferred authority on him and in timothy's particular special case one of the early prophets of the church had revealed how timothy would serve christ okay now, let me say a little bit about the laying on of hands. It did not communicate the gift. And there are some in our culture today, in church culture, who think that you got to come through them to get to the Lord. That's not true. Uh, um, but, but ordination and the laying on of hands is the outward expression of the authority that is conferred by the church. Okay. Um, 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 this is why we do that today. And God help these renegades that just want to start their own thing without thinking about the fact that, that, that you ought to allow somebody to train you and position you and to help you, okay? And um, what, uh, in what phases of the church can we see this 
laying on of hands? When is it traditionally done? The ordination of pastors and deacons. Um, um, that's when it's traditionally done. And the reason for that is because we are conferring the authority of the church to do certain things, to serve in certain capacities. Um, and we have a group of ministers within second, some who are ordained and some who are not, some who should already be ordained that we will work with to that end. Um, um, and I'm old school. I don't, I don't know about ordaining people just because, but if a person is able to serve in a certain capacity or function that requires ordination, they ought to be, a, we ought to ordain them if they have proven uh, that they are worthy of that. If they have that renegade attitude and they want to do their own thing and not be held accountable. There's no point in rene in, in ordaining them. Okay. But if um, we have, if you call a person minister and then you call another one reverend, does that mean that one is ordained and one isn't? No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Um, um, hold on, I got to text my wife. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really mean that. That is something that we have done as a tradition that we call those who are not ordained ministers and we call those who are ordained reverend. Um, that, that, that is a tradition. Uh, but the word reverend has to do with somebody's character, not whether or not they're ordained. Um, that is how we identify them in the Baptist church. If somebody's ordained, we call them reverend so-and-so or minister so-and-so. But I will sometimes slip and call somebody reverend who's not ordained. And I'm not thinking about ordination. I'm thinking about character uh, when I use those words. Uh, but that is our tradition. It's not scriptural, but it is our tradition because I don't think Paul ever called himself Reverend, Bishop, Doctor, anything. Um, those are those are those are man-made titles, but that is why we use them, uh, uh, and that's that's a term of respect. Um, um, what Paul wanted Timothy to understand, lastly, is that he didn't have to prove himself. To people, his growth in leadership would be obvious. Uh, Paul says to Timothy that if you do these things, uh, if you if for in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. His progress in verse 15 would be evident to all. Sometimes we're so worried about proving our intelligence, our worth, what we know that we make a fool of ourselves, acting like Arnold Horshack in class. But, but the truth of the matter is just serve, just serve, be faithful, do the work, show the example and people will see it, okay? But let me encourage us, don't ever serve for attaboys because the same people that will cheer you one day will crucify you another. The same people that you help will turn around and stab you in the back. Uh, the same people that you give your life to will try to take your life from you. They did that to Jesus and that's the reality of ministry, okay? <laughs> Don't make don't mean to sound gloomy, but I have to tell us the truth because some people are ambitious to get into ministry. And then when they get wounded, they crack up. All right. Enough talking for me. Let's get into our discussion questions and then you all can talk and answer some of these questions. Uh, what things from chapter three, verse 14 through chapter five, four, verse Five, did Paul want Timothy to point out to his hearers? What things? Wanted him to point out uh, the church leadership uh, and how they should behave themselves or how they should conduct themselves. He wanted to put out them that they should remember to teach the great mystery of godliness about Christ's birth, his resurrection, and so forth. And he wanted them to point out 
that some will leave the faith. He wants them to be able to identify hypocrisy and not fall into that trap. All right. Outstanding. Thank you. So he, he wanted to point out to Timothy about the fact that some would abandon the faith, but specifically that, that piece in chapter uh, 4, verse 16, the scripture, uh, he wanted to make sure that the, the folks memorized uh, uh, what Christ had done, okay? And so the mystery is part of that. All right, question number two, according to Dr. Constable's notes on page 83, why would some repudiate the truth? Go ahead. This would come about as a result of them listening to persuasive arguments put forth by God's spiritual enemies. So, and behind that were deceitful spirits and unsound doctrine and demons. Yes, because they had their ears tuned to something and someone other than the truth. Uh, they, would, they would begin to argue against it. Uh, how do we define a carnal Christian and how does Satan attempt to use them? What's a carnal Christian? How does the devil try to use them? A Christian who follows the impulse of his or her sinful human nature rather than those of the Holy Spirit is a carnal believer. All right, so they follow the impulses of their what? Say it again, Deacon. Of his, impulses of his or her sinful human nature rather yes. than the, those of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Uh, how does the devil attempt to use these people? He uses them to lead others onto the wrong path to accomplish yes. his work. Yes, to lead others astray to accomplish his work. This is where division, strife, arguing, ambition, uh, all of that foolishness comes from in the church, okay? How do these apostates and false teachers stop believing God? How do they stop believing? Uh, they develop a, a, a a seared conscious and refusing to respond to the truth what they know or what they knew yes listen if we stop responding to the truth in effect we anesthetize ourselves against it um, um and some of us may have had experiences in our lives where we were there go ahead sister murphy uh, one of the things that was in our that we discussed uh, in our group, it was this uh, sentence that said, "Whenever, whenever we affirm with our lips something that we deny with our lives, whether people know it or not, we deaden our consciences just a little more." Mm. Say it again. Whenever we affirm with our lips something that we deny with our lives whether people know it or not, we deaden our consciences just a little more. Yeah, because what we are doing is we are lying to ourselves. We are proclaiming truth, but living a lie. And the result of that is spiritual weakness. And you can see that in the lives of people who only use the scriptures to make themselves look like they're spiritually alive or they're spiritually powerful or spiritually enabled. Uh, but the woodenness, the, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's mechanical righteousness. It's not organic and genuine, okay? 
All right. What was the teaching that Paul was warning Timothy and the Ephesians about and how was it related to Gnosticism? He was warning him against the doctrine of demons uh, about spiritual spiritualists were associating with the dead, talking with the dead, and he taught them about evil people should try. And he also this the uh, doctrine that people should try to live with a little as little attachment to physical things as possible. And right. he asked what, them to be aware of that and to avoid that. What is that, what is that doctrine that people should live with as little physical attachments as possible called? Somebody help us out here. Asceticism. Thank you, Brother Ellis. Yeah. Asceticism says that we should live without things because things are evil. Okay. Um, and what is what should our relationship to those good things that God has created really be? We should uh, say that everything that is created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected, but is to be received with thanksgiving. All right. Listen, I know there was repetition in those questions, but the reason for that is because these ideas are beginning to permeate our culture again. In reaction, to the debauchery we see in our culture, some Christians have created a measuring rubric of what is righteousness. Uh, and it's false because it doesn't agree with God's word. So we ought to be just as careful. What was Timothy's responsibility in verses six through seven to the people he served? Somebody we haven't heard from yet, help us out. point out the truth all right thank you sister mosley to point out the truth to share the truth of god's words with the people in different ways all right what was his responsibility for himself know the word to know the word what else to practice it to practice it, yes, thank you, thank you. To put what he had learned into practice, to train and discipline himself in godliness, all right? Uh, uh, what were the things that he was commanded to teach in verses eight through 10? All right, we're struggling with this one a little bit. Okay. And that is that, that, go ahead, Brother Ellis, go ahead. So I ended up putting down um, that uh, hope in Christ was in Christ's salvation, which is available um, and sufficient for all, but for those who believe it's efficient um, because we believe oh in goodness. Christ. Yes, and so the hope that we have in Christ is sufficient, but for those who believe it is efficient, it 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 works in us and it works on us. The reason that we discipline ourselves is because of Christ who is in us. Yeah, that's really good. I like that, doctor. Thank you. All right. Uh, how could Timothy's example be followed by those who were older than him? Go 
Come on and talk to me. How could Timothy's example be followed? Paul, Paul called him to live a life that was godly, that no, no one could despise his youth. Yes. Paul, Paul told him to set an example in the way he carried himself, the way he talked, the way he walked, the way he speak, the way he lived. Yes. Go ahead, Dick. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, yeah, that, that's true what each one of them was saying. I just want to jump on that one. Yeah. They have to, the older people have to really receive and understand that God is in a movement to use someone that can reach that gap between the elder and the youth. And he may use that younger person. So with Timothy coming along, he may reach the youth, the younger ones than with the elder ones I believe in NC. So it's a guide for them both. Yes. And what God will do is he will use people who are able to relate to those who are older and younger, but our credibility is a result of our character. You might want to write that down. Credibility is the result of character. Okay. And let me let me give us a quick, quick little lesson. Reputation is what people believe you are. Reputation is what people believe you are. We are. Character is what we truly are. Reputation is what people believe we are. That can be good or bad. But character is what we truly are. And it is character that gives us credibility. Just do the work. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Okay. All right. And 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 let me say this: those who do the work without drawing attention to themselves, the Lord elevates and the church appreciates. <laughs> those who do the work without drawing attention to themselves, the Lord elevates and the church appreciates. That's why some of you are where you are now. You just did the work. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. What were Timothy's three primary duties? In verse 13. Read scripture, preach scripture, and teach scripture. Yes. Read scripture, preach the scripture, and teach the scripture. All right, somebody help us out with this last statement. No one who really wants to blank can afford to blank. He must make it blank. <laughs> I didn't do a great job with that one, but somebody help us out. I know y'all found that one, right? No one who really wants to count for God can afford to play at Christianity. He must make it the one great business of his life. Yes, no one who really wants to what? Count for God can afford to play at Christianity. Oh my make goodness. It the one great business of his life. All right, God bless you. Thank you all for sharing with us. Um, anybody have uh, any questions, we will take them. We thank God for you. At this time, we're going to stop our recording.